Hi everyone, it's almost 10. Um, we will get started in just a minute or so, let people kind of get settled in and then we'll get going. Sounds good. Oh, I did see, I didn't have uh, access to the questions tab. Do you have that? Could you give me access real quick? I just wanna make sure we have that. Do you, did you find it, Trevor? I just have the chat. I don't have the questions. Mm -hmm. Unless it went away somewhere. Or you make me like a co-organizer, then I may, maybe it'll pop up. I don't know. It'll work. Yeah, I just made you organizer. Do you see it now? Yep. Got it. Thanks. All right. It is 10 o'clock straight up, it looks like. Uh, people are still rolling in, but um, we've got a lot of information, so let's get going. Welcome, everyone, to our four part series um, on design operations and maintenance deep dive for heat pump water heating, commercial heat pump water heating. Um, Lighting Design Lab, which is part of Seattle City Light, um, has our, our friends with DNR International and Ecotope uh, to deliver this for you. And I guess without further ado, uh, let's take it away, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for joining us here today. Um, my name is Trevor Davis from DNR International and our uh, presenter today, our trainer today is going to be Colin Grist. Um, and yeah, so this is part one of the commercial heat pump water heating design and maintenance course. So hope to be able to see you um, all for parts uh, two, three and four. Um, and with that, I'll just uh, hand it off to Colin. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Trevor. And hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a rainy Seattle morning here in uh, Seattle, of course. And my name is Colin Grist. I'm a mechanical engineer from Ecotope, a mechanical energy and plumbing design firm in the Seattle area. And I have been working with Ecotope for over eight years uh, on commercial heat pump water heating systems. So I am here for these first two sessions we see on the screen today to discuss what is a commercial heat pump water heating system and what are the key design considerations that are essential for successful installations and operations of those commercial heat pump water heating systems. Then my coworker, uh, Evan Green, will be presenting on session three and session four, where we look at that commercial heat pump water heating system more from the lens of the installer in how to install and get that system up and running and then how to maintain that system so that it's operating reliably uh, and efficiently for the duration of its useful life. So we have a lot of great information covered across these four sessions. Today we'll definitely cover some introductory material and start to dive into some of the key uh, design considerations and discuss commercial heat pump water heating systems in general. And then later in session two, session three, and session four, we really dive into some great details that are uh, really influential in successful installations of these commercial systems. So today, we're, our key question is, do I want a commercial heat pump water heating system in the building that I'm working on? And I hope we all come out of this answering yes, um, and because they are systems that save a dramatic amount of energy. And it's one system that we can interact with in typically the basement to get all that energy savings. So there's great opportunity here across many building types. And so we'll discuss what building types make sense for a heat pump water heater. And, and what amount of savings you can expect, as well as diving into uh, what those commercial systems look like, uh, because there's, there's a lot of variation between them. 
And I'll pass this back to Trevor, who will introduce the Slido, but it's a great interactive tool that we have uh, at our use here so that we can engage with you in this virtual classroom environment. Yeah, thanks, Colin, and uh, thanks for the introduction here. Um, so yes, yeah, so we use Slido throughout the, the presentation, so there's a few ways you can access it. So you can just go to slido.com, and you'll see enter an event code, and you can just put in design one. Um, or another way, uh, which uh, you'll see here when Colin uh, goes to the next slide, is there's like a little QR code here in the um, in the, the top left. Uh, so you can just hold your cameras, uh, your phone's camera right up to there, and you'll see you get a pop-up, and it'll take you right to whatever the question is. Um, and you can just go through, fill out the, this one is going to be introduction survey, but we'll have different check-in points throughout the presentation where we get to have some participation from you guys. I know we're trying to do these things in a virtual world, so um, hopefully be able to get some participation and some feedback from where everyone's coming from and just a little bit about, um, about everyone. Um, a few things too, I forgot to note before we got started here. Um, if, if anyone has not joined us before for the GoTo webinar, um, just a reminder, you have the, the questions tab there on the, the Go to platform. Um, so feel free to use that. I'm going to be watching the questions. Um, and if you have any that throughout the presentation, I'll bring them up to Colin during our our check-in points. Um, and if you have any sort of any technical issues or anything, please feel free to drop those in the chat. But we'll be keeping an eye on both of those as we progress through. Um, and I think the last thing is if your audio is starting to, you're starting to cut out, you can also use the you can drop down the audio tab and then you can use the phone call in number, which also so me resolve some of those issues. But um, yeah, please let me know if you have any issues, again, on the Slido or or anything else as we go through. Thanks. Great. Here. And it looks like we have uh, 25 attendees, Colin, just as a note. Great. So what professionals are joining us today? We have some energy consultants, energy efficiency consultants, engineers, utility conservation engineer, Commissioning agents, great to see you here. Those later sessions, especially session three and four, will be uh, great if you can attend that on the commissioning front. Super important step in commercial heat pump water heating system implementation, as well as you know all mechanical and plumbing electrical systems. Really important that we commission those those systems. Energy analysts, awesome. I think we have a great group of folks here today, and I think we can look at commercial heat pump water heating systems through the lens that uh, you're looking through. Developers, great. Thanks for joining us. So what's your experience? We have, uh, most of us are dabblers, some background knowledge, but eager to learn have some novice folks, uh, no all-stars. No one wants to come teach this class with me. I always uh, have that as an option. Um, at least it's great to get get your insight if, if you're familiar with the system. Um, but if you've heard of commercial heat pump water heaters before, uh, then you're probably in that dabbler category. Maybe you know what a heat pump is. Um, novice, you know, you, you definitely might know what a heat pump water heater is too, but not maybe not have seen one in practice. And so we're, we have some case studies here today so we can show you them uh, in a virtual environment. Um, and we also have some great online educational modules which you can uh, go through video tours and 3D interactive tours, which are really cool, uh, that, a cool, cool program that's been developed so that you can set eyes on this from your computer at home or the office, wherever you are. What questions do we have today? Uh, want more efficient schools? I want more efficient schools too. And commercial heat pump water heating systems will help make those schools more efficient. Uh, so I hope that 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 addresses that and we give you some direction on what type of system might work best for that school in the later sessions. What to learn about domestic hot water systems for our multifamily projects? Yes. We're, we know that uh, in Seattle, it's now or soon will be code required to put commercial heat pump water heating systems in multifamily buildings. So it's great that we understand what those systems are and what they're comprised of. Uh, 
great. These sessions do overlap a little bit with the sessions earlier this month um, and a lot of more detailed information in the later sessions. So please join those. So the first thing we're going to start off with is a case study. Um, our audience typically likes to see case studies because we want to see these systems in person. And that's challenging right now with COVID and also just getting building access. So let's look at a few of these systems virtually, uh, just through some photos. But the first one we're going to look at is Hope Workstation, which is a newly constructed multifamily building in Washington State on the west side of the Cascades. There's those beautiful mountains right there. And this is a building that's serving low income, uh, formerly homeless tenants. And it is a, um, a four story multifamily building. It has one ground floor of retail. And so basically three primary floors of residential. And the project had really ambitious net zero energy targets. Um, and so there's a ton of solar PV, photovoltaic solar, that's helping achieve that uh, net zero energy target that the building set. And this project has a commercial heat pump water heating system. The commercial heat pump water heating system isn't a big massive system in the basement. It's actually using residential sand in, that's the manufacturer or sand code two, heat pump water heaters that are located on the roof with the storage tank that's located one level below in a accessible closet off the corridor and in that storage tank room there's also a mixing valve and some other components uh, heat trace on the temperature maintenance or the hot water piping that's distributing that hot water through the building so this commercial building, because it's using residentially sized heat pump water heating equipment, which is around 15,000 BTUs per hour, or just over one ton of heat capacity. These are small clustered systems that were distributed. So you see multiple sand in heat pump water heaters. And essentially the engineer that designed this took a vertical design approach with their distribution system and their heat pump water heating system. So we have one heat pump water heater located on the roof, a storage tank below, and then there's a set of distribution pipes that serves that building vertically to those residents. And what that allowed us to do, or the engineer to do, is to reduce the amount of distribution piping in the building, the amount of hot water piping that's taking that hot heated water from your storage tank throughout the building. And by making a bunch of smaller hot water zones vertically in the building, we are able to dramatically reduce the amount of energy loss associated with that distribution piping, which I'll show a graph later that just shows how great or how large of, of losses those can be in a typical multifamily building. And this also allowed us to use a less expensive residential heat pump water heater, but still operate it within its limitations um, because this unit is able to serve about six occupants, sometimes more depending on the, the water use per day and how large of a storage tank or battery you have. So this was a great system that's working really efficiently. And this building is actually net positive energy right now, meaning that because of the energy efficiency measures, one of which was a commercial heat pump water heating system, and the other energy efficiency measures in the building, the solar photovoltaic panels on the roof, which you can see right here, are actually generating more energy on an annual basis than this building is using. And that's a really great place to, to land with this building design because it's really pushing the forefront of sustainability and showing that we can do this even if it's a building that doesn't have as much capital as some of the other ones because it's serving lower income, formerly homeless people um, and getting, getting some, uh, some grants and so forth to do that. So a great opportunity for energy savings here with this um, sand in CO2 heat pump water heating system in a very simple design 
um, that aligns with with the building layout and and architectural and uh, serves that building vertically. So looking at the system a little bit more, we have our sand in heat and water heaters on the roof, and each one of these is connected to a storage tank. And that hot water storage tank lives one level below near that heat pump. So there's a short amount of distribution or piping between to and from this. There's also a thermostatic mixing valve up in that corner and the controller because it's an electronic thermostatic mixing valve. And then we have distribution piping in this building to bring the hot water down a few floors to serve those lower fixtures. But we don't have a massive distribution system. It's small zonal systems, and we could downsize that pipe. Instead of having one big main, we have smaller mains or just essentially our risers. We reduce that main hot water pipe in the building, which is usually on level one or two. But because uh, the sand in heat pump water heaters don't deal with warm water entering and heating that up and feeding it back to the storage tank, we put a heat trace. Uh, device on the distribution piping. And so that is an electrical element that's under the insulation against the distribution piping, keeping that water in the pipe at 120 degrees so that we don't have to circulate that water back to our storage tank and reheat it with a heat pump that struggles to heat that warm water coming back to it. So here are a few you know, basic bullet points about the building. There's a total of, of 13 of those sand and heat pump water heaters, and each one is connected either to 120 or a 84 gallon storage tank. There's no hot water circulation. The engineers chose to do heat trace here. It's located on the roof, and the predicted energy use is, is shown down here. So 76 kilowatts per day, or kilowatt hours per day, excuse me. So this has been a great, successful, uh, low first cost system that's operating relatively efficiently, even though we have electric resistance on the distribution piping because we were able to minimize those losses and, and insulate that pipe, of course. Oh, Colin, just real quick, um, that last picture you had, what is that little red looped tube? That red loop yeah. there? Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. That is a piece of heat trace. So that's basically an electric resistance element. It's a it's a wire that is designed to heat up to discharge heat to the piping. And so this is typically used for freeze protection to keep the piping above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But in this case, we're using that to keep the piping at 120 degrees so that we don't have a hot water recirculation system here pumping water continuously through this pipe, taking that water back to our storage, reheating it, and it going out again. It's a way to, to reheat that, that distribution or keep that distribution system at temperature. And that's okay. important because we don't want our tenants to flush a lot of cool water in the hot water piping down the drain, or we want a good response time. Makes sense, thanks. So any uh, key takeaways here, or one of the key takeaways I, I have, I don't know, you might have others, is that clustered systems, the small residential equipment can be economical, great installations that result in uh, energy efficiency or a great energy efficiency measure and, and real energy savings in our multifamily buildings. So after exploring this case study, we have our Slido again here. What are you interested in learning more about that temperature maintenance system, how to reduce the losses, what a sand and heat pump water heater is, what type of refrigerant does that heat pump water heater use? What are some of your curiosities here? So one of the questions is, could you comment on the decision to go with heat trace rather than recirc and reheat? I'm assuming that calculations were done and there is some break even point. Yes, so we looked at basically uh, reheating that water with a typical recirculation pump 
and then a temperature maintenance swing tank, which is essentially an electric resistance water heater that the hot water circulates through. And so that unit would be reheating that water. But because that piece of equipment has additional first costs and because of some of the space concerns in the building, we convinced the architect that we could um, simplify the distribution piping and reheat that with electric resistance uh, with a very small distribution system using that heat trace tape product. Uh, and, and that was a less first cost and uh, also prevented the sand and heat pump water heater from receiving that warm water and that's a point where the unit's challenged and creates reliability issues. So that avoided that. What is the appropriate temperature for the mixing valve and heat trace? Great question. So typically our mixing valve, we wanna send water out above 120, but below 125. I usually like to target 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we wanna keep that heat trace a little bit lower than that. Uh, ideally we want that, or wanna prevent that system from running. We can do that through extra insulation and also having a lower temperature set point closer to 120. Uh, the heat pumps and cold snaps, great question. So we have to think about freeze protection when the heat pump is located outside, especially in Seattle where we know it snows and gets cold on an annual basis. And that water piping outside can present an issue. Um, there's a few design approaches approaches. One is with the sand-in controls um, to, to circulate water periodically through the piping connecting the storage tank and the heat pump. And the other is with a uh, freeze protection type of heat trace product. Temperature at which it becomes too hot for rodents to tolerate. I don't know, but if you look that up, please send me an email about that. That would be an interesting, interesting point. Can heat trace solve the issues of heat pump water heaters being used for radiant space heating in residential homes? The issue is heat pump water heaters not working to make hot water, not warm water. Um, that would be essentially an electric resistance radiant system if we use the heat trace product for that radiant. So really we wanna minimize the amount of heat trace we're using and the amount of load it's seen. And so we can do that by minimizing the length of piping or distribution piping which is what we did in the Hopeworks example. If you had a radiant system, you'd actually be increasing that distribution piping. So not a good um, design approach. As well as um, that heating from the heat trace is electric resistance heating. And we wanna do heat pump radiant systems ideally because that would dramatically reduce the energy load of that uh, space heating radiant system. And so we want to be moving away from uh, those heat trace products for, for systems like that. And there's certain heat pumps that are work totally fine at taking in warm water and heating it up to 110, 115 degrees for your radiant application. That might not be the same heat pump that's suitable for a domestic hot water application. And that's one area that um, a lot of people want to push towards is a combined system that serves both your domestic and your space conditioning loads. But in reality, that becomes uh, technically challenging and heat pumps typically uh, don't operate the best uh, when trying to reheat or, or heat for both those tasks. So today we're really focused on air source heat pumps for domestic applications. How much insulation goes into the hot water line? Yes, it's dependent on the Seattle Energy Code, but primarily it's one inch or greater on all of our hot water lines. And often it's close to one and a half or two inches for some of our larger uh, hot water pipes. Um, and the uh, break point is around one and a half inch pipe diameter. CO2 not for recircling radi radiant systems yet, yeah, not a good approach. Uh, so if heat pumps cannot keep up when it's 40 degrees or less, the heat rate makes up the difference. So the sand in heat pump water heater uses CO2 as the refrigerant, and that refrigerant works down to about negative five degrees Fahrenheit. So although this 40 degree point is true for a lot of R134A heat pump water heaters, 
it is not appropriate for our CO2 based heat pumps like the Sandin product. And then the heat trace in this uh, in this design is really just keeping that water in the distribution piping warm. It's not heating up cool water for use at the tap uh, or making cool water hot so that we can take a shower. So I hope I answered most of those questions uh, pretty well and we're gonna keep rolling along here so we uh, keep on schedule. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is, is why choose a commercial heat pump water heating system? Well, one of the reasons to choose one is for energy savings. You can dramatically cut your uh, annual energy use in the building by applying a heat pump water heater. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have our baseline multifamily building in the Pacific Northwest. And we can see that about 25% of the energy going into this building on an annual basis is for heating water. 15% of that is useful water heating energy that we either used by showering or cleaning up after we cooked a delicious meal or doing laundry. 10% of that in our large multifamily buildings or our typically sized mid-rise multifamily buildings is losses associated with the, the temperature maintenance system or the hot water circulation system and the distribution piping in that building. So there's an enormous amount of losses uh, that, that are contributing to this 25% of the pie and we really want to drive down those losses and we give you some points in later sessions on how to do that. But we also want to uh, reduce this load with the heat pump water heater. And so on the right hand side, if we apply a heat pump water heater to the same exact multifamily building, we can cut those energy uses down by three and save about 17% on average over the course of a year which is an enormous amount of savings when we think about we're just treating or replacing one system in the building that's typically in a parking garage in these you know larger buildings or in a boiler room somewhere down uh, in the basement or, or possibly on the roof of our high-rise type building construction. Whereas some of the other energy efficiency measures we commonly do like space conditioning, heat pumps, or LED lights, we're, we're, we're reducing these portions of the pie, but we have to touch a lot more things, especially if they're lights, we gotta you know, replace all the lights or design those lights into the building. So it's great that we have this uh, large piece of the pie associated with domestic hot water use, and we can cut that down by a factor of three just by implementing a commercial heat pump water heating system for that, for that building. And this is one of the reasons why the Seattle Energy Code, the commercial code, is now driving this as a requirement. In the previous code cycles, it's been in the C406 options table, the efficiency or the additional efficiency packages, if anyone's familiar with the code. But now uh, in C404, we can see that in group R1 and R2, so multifamily greater than three stories and our hotel motel occupancies, with central water heating systems, they must be served by an air source heat pump water heating system, not fossil fuel or electric resistance. And Seattle and Washington State have established these uh, targets to reduce energy in the built environment and the code is addressing that uh, in, in one way here through the commercial heat pump water heating system. And we've proven uh, both at Ecotope and other engineering firms that this is a very successful way to achieve energy savings in our, in our multifamily buildings as well as other building types with the commercial heat pump water heating system. This is the Sunset Electric Building in Capitol Hill. There is a good brewery, or there was a couple of years ago at least, I'm not sure if it's still there, down there. Um, and it's uh, five stories of, of residences essentially above that. And this project has a air source heat pump water heating system that uses the Colmac 
heat pump water heater. And it's located in the basement garage of this building and it has dramatically helped reduce the, the energy use uh, on an annual basis. So we see here that this large bar graph of a energy use intensity EUI of 63. That's the 2030 baseline challenge. The Seattle mid-rise baseline challenge is what we typically compare to. That's 39. And the actual energy use here comes out to 22.7. And one of those measures that dramatically helped reduce that was that heat pump water heating system along with the ventilation system, the space conditioning system, and the, the LED lighting system in this building. We were able to take that and uh, cut it down significantly from this 2030 baseline and, and fairly significantly from this uh, Seattle mid-rise baseline. So this is a proven concept that's been operating for the past 10 plus years uh, or longer in some buildings. And another case study or another example of, of great success is the Elizabeth James House. This is another or a, a multifamily building that's serving senior or low income tenants. It was an existing building that had an existing electric resistance water heating system that got replaced with a sand in heat pump water heating system using the swing tank design approach, which we'll cover in session two. And those are using CO2 heat pump water heaters, which have a minimum ambient air operating temperature closer to negative five. So we can operate these outside all year long. And so they're actually located right about here uh, in this picture, but you can't see them. And in the end, we were able to save uh, each one of the tenants about $100 each year on their domestic water heating bill because we dramatically reduced the uh, total energy use of that, uh, of that system after implementing the heat pump water heaters here. And so another benefit to these commercial heat pump water heating systems is we are typically trading off how much heat capacity we need to be generating with that heat pump and the amount of storage or the size of that battery bank, the hot water storage tank. And we can trade those off to meet a given load. And often it's in our favor to prioritize more storage tank volume than heat pump capacity to meet that load. And if we prioritize more storage tank volume, then we often can align the hot water load to be load shift ready or to align with time of use pricing when electricity is expensive on the grid. Right now in Seattle, we're lucky enough not to have time of use pricing in our electrical grid from Seattle City Light, but there's many other areas of the country, California specifically, has these time of use rates. And one of the huge benefits of these commercial systems is we can use them to our advantage to capture uh, that time of use and the lower uh, prices that we typically see when there's a lot of solar photovoltaic available on the grid. So we're generating a lot of energy through our solar panels when the sun's out in the middle of the day. And typically our hot water system was running early in the morning when we have this big peak here. You can see our load profile for, for use is this orange line. And so our hot water system would run then from five to 10 in the morning. We don't have a lot of solar there, but typically that was a gas water heating system. So it doesn't really matter when we're using that. It's starting to matter when we're using electricity because a lot of systems are switching to that electrical grid and the electrical grid is, is strained already. So we can better uh, future proof these commercial heat pump water heating systems by providing or prioritizing storage over heat capacity and then designing the system to align with peak time of use pricing. Even if it's not occurring now, this would be beneficial you know, in the future if it, if it ever does occur. And it's essentially a free no cost thing to, to prepare yourself for. But essentially what we're doing with this uh, grid flexibility or aligning with time of use pricing is running the heat pump when electricity is cheap on the grid 
and that's typically in these daytime hours. And then as soon as we have our peak time of use pricing in the evening, we shut that heat pump off and we have enough stored hot water in the storage tanks then to coast through that period where electricity is expensive. And then as soon as electricity gets less expensive again, we can turn that heat pump on and run. And what we're doing is we're typically just running more in the daytime hours and a little bit early in the morning or in the wee hours of the morning rather than uh, having this system run later in the day for shorter durations to, to align with those peak load periods. So a great opportunity here for energy and financial savings, especially if you're the one paying the bill, uh, as, as well as future-proofing yourself um, to uh, potentially align with uh, time of use pricing and, and load shifting on the grid. So any motivations out there for implementing these commercial heat pump water heating systems? Hopefully we're all motivated by energy savings, which usually means financial savings in our pocketbook, as long as we can drive down that first cost of installation. And then there's also societal measures. You know, we as a society want to be more efficient so that we can have a better future for, you know, more than seven generations down the line, or at least longer than one or two generations. So there's lots of reasons why to implement these commercial heat pump water heating systems. Um, and I hope, hopefully uh, you guys recognize a, a few of those. Yeah, decarbonization, right? Fossil fuels, there's tons of studies that burning fossil fuels in our homes, in our residences is not good, is not healthy. Uh, the, you know, a lot of people said it was fine to begin with, but there's tons of case studies and really great medical journals on the amount of asthma in children in homes that have gas cooking or other gas appliances. It leaks, homes blow up, it's dangerous. We need to be decarbonizing and commercial heat and water heating systems are definitely one way to do that. Lower the consumption of energy, do the right thing. Yes, we have a moral obligation. Yes, all of our electric H2 systems are residential heating. We want to replace our fossil fuel H2O systems as well. Yes, so we can do um, hydronic systems as well as uh, domestic hot water systems with commercial heat pumps. And some uh, code requirements driving some of us too. Great. And Colin, we had two, one sort of question or sort of point of clarification. Um, they were saying, I think on one of the previous slides you had, um, they said they had some opportunities to use ground loop systems for H2O and basically saying that they, think they assume they can substitute for air source in the code. Do you, do you know if that's possible like substituting air for the H2O in the? Um, so the, the code is written to require either air source, heat pump water heaters, and I think there is an exception for ground uh, ground source heat pump water heaters. Essentially, heat pumps extracting heat, and it's typically extracting it from the air, especially when we're talking about air source heat pumps. Mm -hmm. But we can extract heat from other sources, like the ground, which is always around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, as long as we're you know low enough in the ground or a few feet down. Um, as well as you know the ocean, there's a lot of available heat there. So we talk about ocean loop heat exchangers or pond loop. Uh, uh, a lot of great options. Thanks. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what is a commercial heat pump water heating system. Typically, there's two um, product types that these commercial systems are built out of, and this is the unitary or integrated heat pump water heater, and then the split system. And what we mean when we talk about the integrated or unitary heat pump water heater is there's a heat pump that's packaged on top that's connected to a storage tank and that has some control system and some backup system is, is also typically present in there. And so that's a packaged device. It's typically sold as a residential product, but AO Smith does have a commercially sized uh, integrated or unitary heat pump water heater that's around two tons of heat capacity. So it's a great option for a grocery store or a Costco, a restaurant, or maybe a smaller hotel uh, 
hotel building, uh, if you could combine a few of them together or residential multifamily building. And then the split system heat pumps, right? We just have the heat pump that split from the storage tank and that heat pump water heater will typically have some controls built in um, and often does not have any backup present. And so this is really just a storage volume or a place to store hot water and a heat pump. And so these are the two ways or the two typical product types is that unitary or integrated heat pump water heater where everything's packaged together, typically the smaller residential products. And this is also a residential product. This is a sand in again, um, but it came with a nice picture of the, the tank next to the heat pump. But these are uh, more available and commercially sized. So at Ecotope, we're typically doing larger commercial buildings and we're using this product along with a lot of other products that are much larger in heat capacity. And most of the split system products um, do come in uh, multiple capacities uh, so that you can match with to, your, to the load of the building. And then our heat pump water heating systems typically come to the market in a few different ways. I am a woodworker, uh, love spending time in the shop. And this custom engineered way is essentially like taking a rough sawn board from your local sawmill, flattening it out, planing it down, jointing it, ripping it with your table saw, cutting it, gluing it together, and packaging that up into a beautiful piece of, of custom woodwork or maybe a chair. And so that's a very custom engineered or, or configured system. And all those pieces might be coming from multiple manufacturers or distributors, or maybe a few are packaged together. But in general, this is built up of you know, numerous different components um, and uh, built up in the field by a qualified plumber uh, and a few technicians to get all that equipment connected and operating together smoothly. There's also more of the IKEA approach um, where this is the specified or built up system. And so this is getting that flat pack of boards from Ikea with your pegs and dowels and a little squeeze tube of wood glue and that famous Ikea Allen wrench and a good set of instructions from your Ikea or your distributor representative. So this is a really great option. I'm super glad that the industry is moving from these custom engineered systems towards the specified built up systems because the distributors, manufacturers, and representatives are really helping us designers and engineers guide and influence our suggestions to a really robust and reliable system design. So in this, um, in this kind of market delivery method, the representative that's send, se selling the heat pump water heater product might also be selling a storage tank that integrates with that heat pump water heater well, and then giving recommendations or a product uh, line um, for an, a backup electric resistance tank if you're doing a sw series swing tank design, uh, as, along with like a pump or a mixing valve or something else. So this is a lot of you know, great movements and, and engineering and background has gone into this, taking us from these very custom engineered systems to more of these uh, specified built up systems with a lot of support and, and good details and instructions on, on how to build that up so that we have a reliable and efficient heat pump water heating system. And then we also have the uh, go to the local furniture store and just buy a couch or a chair, whatever you're going to make. And that's the package skid approach where everything is packaged together, the storage tank, the heat pump water heater, the piping to and from, maybe a backup um, uh, heating system as well, a control system. And all the designer or installer has to do is connect hot and cold distribution piping to this and an electrical connection and, and potentially that uh, hot water circulation piping as well. Um, 
this really minimizes the amount of labor in the field and takes out some of the uh, uncertainty around the system design and configuration, how we're connecting all these pipes together uh, with really proven packaged systems um, that also include a control. So it's fantastic that over the past uh, eight to 10 years, we've seen the industry really moving from these commercial custom engineered systems to more of these packaged or, or uh, more designer friendly um, keep them water heating systems out there. And this is uh, actually one from Mitsubishi called the Origin. So our commercial heat pump water heating systems, um, they're actually fairly similar to our residential, smaller integrated heat pump water heaters. I have one of these in the basement of my Seattle home here that just runs you know, every morning to, uh, to heat water so that we can take showers and, and do laundry and so forth. And it works great, very packaged system. It has backup built in shown here by this electric resistance as well as a heat pump that controls and everything. So it's a really great system. Um, unfortunately, there aren't these in the commercially sized products yet that skid is pushing more towards that. So we typically have been building these systems up. And so shown here is the Jackson Apartments building. This is in the Seattle area. It's a multifamily building. There's two hot water plants. This one's serving about 200 units. Um, and these systems, this residential product and this commercial system that's uh, much more built up and complicated have the same four fundamental components. The first one is, of course, the heat pump water heater. That residential product typically has it on top of the unit. In our commercial systems, we're going to see these bigger commercial products that look similar to the VRF heat pumps, if, if ever, anyone's familiar with that technology. We also have um, some kind of backup system often, and shown here is that is in the large electric resistance tank. And in this uh, example here, Jackson Apartments, there's actually a heat pump tied to this tank to uh, provide heat to, to that system to prevent that electric resistance element from running but we might have it, so I'm noting it here, is we have some type of temperature maintenance system, uh, and, and, and that might have a backup uh, electrical element with it. And then we have a storage tank. So that's this volume here shown in red, orange, and blue. And in our Jackson Apartments example, there's three large 500-gallon white tanks here that are connected together. So the storage tank is also uh, present. And then the last of our four components is that uh, control system. And so that's typically just on the side of the residential product. And we have a control system in these Colmax and we could use that, but in some of our larger systems, we might be specifying a third party control system. So this is the controller that actually sits on the wall right behind this heat pump here and controls both the heat pumps, the mixing valve, and the backup system in this building. It also trends uh, the water temperatures and, and hot water flow rates so that we can look at how much energy is going into the system and coming out as useful uh, water heating energy. And regardless of of how we're building up our systems, we have a few products to utilize. And so these are six products that we picked out. Uh, doesn't represent every each and every uh, air source heat pump, pump available on the market today, but these are some of the most common um, players in the market. And we have our Ream one ton heat pump water heater, which is great for a single family residential application but we can also use this in a commercial environment. And then we have that AO Smith, the slightly larger integrated heat pump water heater. There's a storage tank behind there, and we have our heat pump on the front of the cabinet shown there. So both our integrated products, both are typically smaller or small commercial sized, 
and both of these use R134A, which is challenged by low ambient air temperatures, and that's what this, uh, this symbol here means. Below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, these aren't going to be successful at moving heat into our water. We also have uh, CO2 or R744 heat pump water heaters. And these are typically split system units. So that's just the heat pump there by Mitsubishi. And there's the heat pump by Sandin. And these would be connected to a storage tank. And these are configured in single pass heating cycle, which we're going to be covering here shortly. Um, but it's, it's good to note that. And then the, we also have other large commercial heat pump water heaters, and I'm showing the Colmac and Nile. Both of these are US manufacturers. Colmac's out here on the West Coast, Nile is on the East Coast. Both really great options for our larger commercial multifamily buildings. However, they're using R134A as the refrigerant, and so that's gonna be challenged by low ambient air temperatures. And so you, you know, if you put these on a roof in Seattle, there's going to be significant portions of the year where this heat pump is in an area that's too cold for it to operate. And so in that case, you need a backup system. However, you can put these in an enclosed parking garage that's underground and use that as a buffered air zone because those underground enclosed parking garages, the low corners of them, typically don't get below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, even when it's 23 degrees outside. And at Ecotop, we've studied that for numerous years and implemented it as a really good design approach to be able to utilize these R134A heat pumps in our Seattle area buildings. So lots of options out there, not as many as uh, the grocery store um, cereal aisle yet. Um, and hopefully we don't get there ever, but um, a handful of good options from various manufacturers, both in and out of the United States uh, for, for commercial heat pump water heater products. And then going through a few examples of what these systems may look like, there is a, a range of the size of the building this is serving, the occupancy of the, the, the occupancy type that the heat pump system serving, and where it's located. So our commercial heat pump water heating systems might look very different from one case to another. Our small commercial systems might just be a residential product with a storage tank coupled to it to extend the battery of that commercial heat pump water heating system or the amount of water we can store in it. And so that's a pretty simple, less expensive, uh, system that can be, you know, the right type of system for smaller buildings, uh, both residential and uh, other types of commercial loads. And then this is uh, the Jackson Apartments building again. And so we can serve these larger multifamily buildings with these larger built up systems using our um, split system, commercially sized heat pump water heater technologies. And then we can also have multiple clustered systems, right? We don't need one um, system in a central application. We can have multiple systems in a central application and just have small centralized zones, meaning that we have smaller distribution zones. Like in the HopeWorks example, we're serving vertically in the building, not running one big central loop around the whole building. So a great option there for using the smaller commercial systems in that clustered arrangement to serve that larger, larger building um, that we might be seeing. So if we have our residential unitary integrated heat pump water heaters, we can connect two of them in parallel with equal distance piping on our cold, hot, and hot water return and operate those, those two units in parallel to serve a bigger load. This might be great for our very you know, small multifamily buildings around two to six units, or maybe in a clustered arrangement. Um, this is also a really great option for a kitchen, a commercial kitchen environment, these residential uh, heat pump water heaters, or even that A.O. Smith commercial unit. 
because when that residential or when that commercial kitchen is in operation, we typically have a cooling load and heat pumps are taking heat out of the air and discharging cool air. And we can discharge that cool air back into that space to provide these awesome chefs and cooks with, with uh, essentially free cooling and really efficient water heating. So a great opportunity in the restaurants, the grocery, uh, a lot of commercial markets where we can reuse that free cool air essentially to, to do some active cooling in the building to keep our spaces or to pre-cool our spaces that are typically need cooling on a 24-7 on a basis or when in operation. So the small commercial systems, right, we can build them out of um, smaller residential or the smaller commercial integrated heat pump water heating products. And this would be the conceptual piping diagram that I would encourage you to utilize uh, to make that happen. But we have larger buildings, whether they're this multifamily building shown here. This is the Batik apartments in the Yesler development area. You can see the Seahawks Stadium there and our port. And this is once again using Colmac heat pump water heaters. This is an older generation of that technology and a bunch of storage tanks. And this is essentially how it's how it's configured, piped together. Um, to serve that larger multifamily building. So great options here, but that's looking a lot different than it did in our smaller uh, commercial residential application. And here we're showing our temperature maintenance system with a parallel loop tank. And that's, a, that's one way to treat this large hot water distribution piping network and the losses associated with it is to provide essentially dedicated heat pumps, one to do that primary heating task, making cold water hot, and one to reheat the temperature maintenance losses. And we're gonna dive into a lot of details about how to do this and why to do one configuration over another in session two of, of this, uh, this presentation seminar. And then uh, another option like the HopeWorks is the multiple smaller commercial systems in this clustered arrangement. Um, that large distribution piping that runs along the bottom of our building in most multifamily buildings and then has risers that come up has a lot of first costs associated with it because it's typically one of the largest pipes in the building um, outside of the cold water main connection. And so if we can reduce that, or eliminate it, it dramatically saves on our first costs. And it also helps with some of our equipment first costs as we don't necessarily need a dedicated temperature maintenance uh, storage tank for this heat pump water heating system design. However, it's really important to drive down those distribution losses if we're heating with electric resistance uh, heat trace tape, because that's a very inefficient or it's a less efficient way to heat than our heat pump. So if we're doing these arrangements and we're using heat trace instead of a parallel loop temperature maintenance tank or a series swing tank, then it's a good idea to, to drive down those losses first, of course. But another great way to serve uh, these, these commercial buildings. We're gonna oh, take a, a oh, minute here yeah. to pause for questions. Yeah, question on the, the last one, um, the fact that it has the sort of the photovoltaics there on the top and it looks like it would cause a little bit of a darker roof. Does that have any sort of effect on how the heat pumps perform compared to say like if that was like a white roof? Do you get any kind of um, performance gain or loss having the photovoltaics up there? Uh, you know, there's probably a tiny, tiny gain or loss, but I don't know. I don't, I don't okay. think so. You think, well, a white roof's gonna reflect heat, which is good for the building but reflecting heat isn't great for the heat pump heat pumps, yeah, right. <laughs> that, Trade off, yeah. that'd be bad for the building but maybe better for the heat pump so maybe the solar is a great uh in between because it's a darkish color and the sunlight heating it hopefully most of it is going into electricity rather than heat any other questions
you know, just like I did before, please feel free to, you know, drop those questions in that questions tab. And, you know, whenever we have a, um, a stopping point, I can bring those up to Colin. So feel free to do the way to this section when you drop those in. Well, we can pause any time for questions. Um, but the next thing we're going to be talking about is those four components of a commercial heat pump water heating system that I noted before. And so without further ado, those four components are the primary heat pump water heater. Oops, excuse me. And that's going to be these heat pump water heaters shown over here. This can be multiple heat pumps connected together to stage in to serve a bigger load, or it could just be a single heat pump water heater. These are the devices that are taking cool water in and making it hot, and we're using that hot water. Those primary heat pump water heaters are storing that water in the primary storage tank. So that's right here on this conceptual image. And that primary storage tank could be multiple tanks, but right now I'm just showing one single tank there. And then we have a temperature maintenance system, and we'll get into this. But in most of our commercial buildings, we're circulating water through the building, regardless if we have an electric resistance water heater or gas water heater or a heat pump water heater. In our large buildings, we're typically circulating that water through the building. Now our gas and our electric resistance water heaters don't really care what temperature that water comes back at because it's a flame or a, a heated coil a burning coil that's putting heat into that water. However, our heat pumps are, depending on the technology used and the refrigerant and the ambient air conditions, what the air temperature is outside, they can be very challenged by that warm return water. And so we typically recommend dedicated or dedicated temperature maintenance system. And that's why you see an additional storage tank and an additional heat pump water heater shown here. And so we have our primary system, which is making water hot, and our temperature maintenance system, which is keeping that water hot in the distribution system. Then we also have our control system as our last and final component. We need to turn on and off these heat pumps based on temperatures in the storage tank or in the system. And so that control system is, is really uh, an important fundamental component of our commercial heat pump water heating systems. And we're going to go through each one of these components um, and note a few interesting features of them. And so the first one we're going to talk about is that primary heat pump water heater, or maybe it's a group of, of heat pump water heaters. And this is really our engine. This is taking cold water in and making it hot. And heat pumps are very good and efficient at operating in that regard. And you know, there's a few manufacturers there on the, on the screen for these larger commercial products. And that heat pump is moving heat, not making heat. And it's much more efficient to move that heat than it is to make it. So with a heat pump, we're gonna move heat from the air into water. And with a gas water heater, we're going to burn a flame to heat the water. So we're making heat with that gas or electric resistance water heater, and we're moving heat with our heat pump water heater. And how heat pump water heaters move heat is not magic. Um, it is a very clever design. And air source heat pump water heaters start over here with this evaporator which is essentially an air to refrigerant heat exchanger. Very similar to the radiator in your car, which is connected to the engine to disperse heat into the air as you drive to get rid of that heat. This is operating the reverse direction. It's trying to capture heat from the air and put that heat into refrigerant. So on the right hand side of the screen, we have our pressure enthalpy diagram for the engineers out there. And I tried to simplify it for uh, our whole audience with a few colors and, and, and little blurbs shown there. And so this first stage or step 
at the evaporator, we're drawing heat in from the air. And so that's really our free energy. And it's nearly free because we have to spin a fan typically to get it to move that air across the coil. So on our pressure enthalpy diagram, when we're uh, in the evaporator stage with this green bar and we're getting a bunch of free heat. And so you see our enthalpy or our energy content is increasing. So we're getting a bunch of free energy there. And that refrigerant is cold at that, at that point. And so we can operate that heat pump at cold ambient air temperatures because the refrigerant is actually cooler than that air. And so in our you know, CO2 cases, if it's three degrees Fahrenheit outside, that refrigerant's actually been, gonna be cooler than that so that we can capture heat into that. Then we pressurize it and pressurizing that boosts the temperature and pressure of that refrigerant. And so that's where we're putting our energy in, is we're still gaining energy, we're still moving to the right, but we're paying for that energy with a compressor, which is essentially a very fancy pump. And by pressurizing it, we're actually increasing the temperature. So we go up to this top line here, and you can think of pressure and temperature as they're similarly. And so then we get to our condenser, which is our refrigerant to water heat exchanger, another heat exchanger, but we're trying to dump the heat now into the water. And so because we boosted the pressure, the temperature increase, and so now this refrigerant is much hotter than our water, a couple hundred degrees. And so then we pass our water through that condenser with the refrigerant going in the other path, and we dump a bunch of energy into that water. And so that's the useful energy that we're getting out of the system. So we put two units or we got two units of free energy in, we paid for one unit and we had to dump three units into our water heating for our uh, commercial heat pump water heating system. And then it's a cycle. So we go through the expansion valve as the last step and that regulates the pressure on each side so that we're reducing the pressure and temperature so that when it goes back into the evaporator, the refrigerant's cold again and we can extract that heat and pass through that cycle again. So this is the heat pump cycle, uh, very similar to how your air conditioner works or your refrigerator or the space conditioning um, VRF split system heat pump that might be in, in a building that you're familiar with. And heat pumps are much more efficient than gas or electric resistance heaters because they're moving that heat, they're not making it. So we're, we're able to, to move that heat into the water. Can we take oh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I had a question on that last uh, diagram um, there on the left. As someone was just asking, like, why do you run the cold water supply through the storage tank before going to the, the heat pump? Yeah, so why does the cold water go in there and then out there? We could just connect the cold water here. And that will work and will probably not be an issue. But this cold water is typically around 50 to 60 degree Fahrenheit. When we operate our heat pump, we're going to turn it on and the bottom of the tank will be cool. As we push hot water into the tank, it's going to push hot water down lower into the, into the, the bottom of the tank. And so then that warm water will then go into the heat pump. And so it might be going in at 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit and be heated up and going in there. Then if we have a big flush of cold water, we have 50 or 60 degree heat or water here. So that results in some conditions where basically this water towards that heat pump can be, you know, 80, 90 degrees at one point towards the end of its heating cycle. And then if a bunch of people use hot water in the building, hot water goes out, cold water must come in, cold water would come in here and that would flush 50 to 60 degree water towards that heat pump that quick change can be problematic for certain heat pumps. Um, and especially it was very problematic for early generations of these um, air source heat pump water heaters. So it's best to just have a dedicated connection for your cold as that acts as a little bit of a buffer. 
Got it. Thanks. Appreciate it. So we have our heat pumps. They're moving heat. They're not making heat. That's much more efficient than, than any other device out there. And there's two types of heating cycles that these heat pumps can be configured in. Single pass is going to take in cold water, often around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, heat it in a single pass to the usable temperature that you set. And that's typically around 140 degrees Fahrenheit and stored in the tank. And so in a single pass, we're going to heat all that water up. And it does this by typically modulating the flow rates of the water going into the unit. Because of different air temperatures, the heat pump um, will either have more air to extract heat from or, or higher more heat in the air to extract or less heat. And so it might have an easy time you know, on our summer day to get that heat. And, uh, and, not as much of a heat capacity on, on our cool winter day uh, because it has to work a little bit harder. And so because of that variation in heat capacity that is available to us, we need to vary the water flow rate to always get a target water temperature going out. So single pass heat pumps typically modulate the inlet water flow, flow rate to always achieve a given water temperature, typically at about 140 degree Fahrenheit into our storage tank. Multi-pass heat pumps, on the other hand, will not modulate the flow rate of the entering water temperature as the single pass heat pumps do. They're just gonna try to dump as much heat as they can into that water for a given pass. So typically these multi-pass units, the water is coming in at 50 degrees, heating up to 60, 60 degrees to 70, 70 to 80, and so forth. And so these devices um, are typically a little bit less efficient when configured in multi-pass than they are in single pass. Single pass, typically more efficient than a multi-pass heat pump water heater. And it's because we're, we're using that full heat pump cycle we talked about on the last slide, or we're going all the way around that loop the best that we can in the most efficient uh, use of energy. But these multi-pass heat pumps are great for our temperature maintenance or a hot water circulation load, as that water typically comes back at around 110 degrees Fahrenheit from our building circulation system. And that multi-pass heat pump is suited typically to put about 10 degrees of heat into that water as it passes through each loop. So, they each serve uh, you know, a purpose or a, they each have a best design case. Um, and there is a little bit difference in efficiency from one to the other. But in general, our single pass heat pumps are very well suited for treating the primary heating load, making cold water hot. Our multi-pass heat pumps are better suited for treating the hot water circulation load or the temperature maintenance load in our building. And there are some considerations, uh, of course, with to take into account when, when working with these commercial systems. The first is our air source or a heat source. These heat pumps need a reliable air or heat source throughout the course of the entire year that they can extract heat from and put that heat into water. So we have to be conscious about where we're putting these heat pumps and what's the coldest temperature that that heat pump will experience. Is it five degrees Fahrenheit? Is it negative five? Is it 45 degrees? Where is that heat pump located? What climate zone? And specifically, maybe where in the building also is it located? Does it have a reliable source of heat or air? And then you also should consider the heating cycle. Is it configured in a single pass or multi-pass? Do I, the designer, flex, have the flexibility to specify one or the other for a single uh, manufactured product? Or if I choose manufacturer A, am I guaranteed or am I stuck with a multi-pass heat pump water heater or a single pass? It's really important to understand what heating cycle that heat pump's configured in and how that uh, influences. Um, your design approach in your system configuration or how you're piping everything together. And then the electrical connection. These heat pumps need electricity. 
typically, especially for our commercial systems, that's 208 volts or higher. It might be it might need a three phase requirement. So it's important to coordinate with the electrician who might be used to the gas water heating system where they only have to provide a few 120 volt outlets with a low amp draw. It's important to early on coordinate with those electrical uh, engineers or electricians to make sure that there's adequate um, electricity for those heat pump water heating systems. Especially if there's a backup electric resistance system, that typically adds a lot of electrical load or potential for a lot of electrical load to the building. So it's a really important idea to be well coordinated there. The other thing to consider is the water connections. Do those water connections to the heat pump, are they susceptible to freezing temperatures? How do I address that? Is freeze protection required? Is there something built into the heat pump that uh, acts as a freeze protection uh, you know, sequence to, to prevent that water from freezing in the pipe? Or do I need to provide some form of product or design solution to prevent against freezing? Because the last thing you want to do is get a call because there's a leak in the building and the pipes froze by the heat pumps. So we don't have any hot water and all the water in the building's off because there's a big leak. The other thing is condensate management. These heat pumps make condensate. So if we're in a garage environment, we want to be routing that condensate to a floor drain that's convenient and out of the way, not a trip hazard. If we're on a rooftop that's susceptible to freezing temperatures, it's also really important to manage that condensate so that the maintenance personnel doesn't go up there on a cold day to check on the system and step on an ice rink as that condensate pooled up and froze. We want to be uh, aware of that and coordinate that with, with the plumbers and, and you know, be next to roof drains, pipe to roof drains, uh, or other or drainage systems in our building. And then maintenance and access. Uh, heat pump water heaters are moving heat from an air source into water. And so there's typically a filter or something on the evaporator to keep this free of debris and lint and other things. And so that air filter typically has a three to four month um, maintenance protocol where the maintenance personnel has to go in there and clean that air filter out, vacuum it with a shop vac or power wash it, something like that, to prevent that lint and, and debris from building up over time, which would cause issues with your heat pump. We also need access to these, to these heat pumps, especially if they're on the roof. We don't want to put them on a roof without any access to them. Um, providing good access and a good maintenance plan really helps get that maintenance uh, or those routine maintenance procedures achieved on time and, and every time and that they're not forgotten about and cause reliability issues down the line. And then sound levels and noise considerations. Our gas and our electric resistance water heaters are essentially silent. Heat pumps are moving heat into the air so they have a fan. That fan makes noise. They also have a compressor. That compressor is typically the louder of, of the, a little bit louder than the fan. So it's really important to consult with the manufacturer on what the sound power level is and can I locate this next to a residential unit or do I need to be providing some acoustical barriers or other uh, means to mitigate the, the, the noise levels going into that residential occupancy. So really important to consider. Um, the heat pumps have very varying sound levels. So a sand and heat pump water heater might be essentially quiet or a DBA level of 38 to 40. In some of the larger commercial heat pump water heaters that are single speed compressors and 20 tons might be closer to 60 or 70 DBA. So significant difference there in the product specified and the application you're serving. So really important to consider uh, those noise levels and they're readily available from the manufacturer um, on their specification sheets. Oops.
Uh, and so that was the primary heat pump water heater. And the next thing we're going to discuss is the storage tank. And I can pause for questions here, Trevor, if there are any. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll keep pushing through. Yeah, nothing, nothing yet. But yeah, you use those Q and A or chat or however you want to do it. Great. Um, so the next thing is our primary storage tank. And heat pump water heaters are not instantaneous heaters. We can buy an instant gas or an instant electric resistance water heater and plug it in. And what we need is a bigger gas pipe to that unit or a bigger electrical you know, wire to those, to those units and they work. It's a very spiky load, but that, that can be a, a design solution with those gas or electric resistance systems. Heat pump water heaters on the other case are moving heat into water. And so that's a process and they're typically slower or have a lower heat generation capacity than a lot of those gas or electric systems. And so it's great to have a way to store that energy. And so our primary storage tank is essentially our battery bank. If you've ever looked at a solar off-grid system or under the hood of a Tesla or another electric vehicle, you'll typically see multiple battery batteries connected in some way to achieve a larger system capacity. And we can do that same thing with our storage tanks. We can connect multiple together to essentially increase our storage volume. And that's really handy because we're often prioritizing more storage volume than heat pump heat capacity for financial reasons in our projects. It's less expensive to buy that extra storage than it is to buy that extra heat capacity to meet a given load. And so if we have multiple storage tanks, we got a few options for connecting them together. And I'm showing two of those options here. We have the in parallel design on the left and the in series design on the right. So we have our heat pump water heater and I'm just showing one right now with our cold water connection. And then it's connecting to three tanks in parallel. And it's really important that we get balancing through our parallel tanks so that the tanks are at the relative average or at a similar temperature across all tanks. If we connected the cold water pipe just to one tank there, then every time cold water went into this system, we'd prioritize it or mostly go through storage tank three. So we wanna use equal distance piping or reverse return piping to get a equal balanced uh, flow path through the tank, depending on which path you take. And then we also want to have a temperature sensor in each tank in the parallel arrangement so that we can look at the average across three tanks and tell the heat pump to turn on or turn off based on that temperature profile. Often a, a simpler, better solution is to connect these storage tanks in series. And that's what I'm showing here on the right-hand side of the screen. And essentially we take the top of one and connect it to the bottom of the other. And what that does is it puts our tanks vertically on top of each other. So you can think of storage tank two sitting up here and storage tank three sitting on top. And that creates a great stratified profile in the tank with a lot of usable hot water at the top and cool water at the bottom for the heat pump to draw in. And the in-series design also has another benefit um, because you don't have to worry about, worry about tank balancing. When cold water comes into the system, it flows into the, into the storage tank and that displaces hot water out into the distribution system. And there's only one flow path for it to take, and it's, it's that. So we don't have to worry about balancing through the tanks. We do have to be conscious about the tank connection sizes more in a series arrangement, because now instead of having the flow split between three tanks, we have it going through one tank and then another. And so we have to make sure these connections and that piping 
is adequately sized for that flow rate so that we're not going you know faster than our our five foot per second rule of thumb um, in our in our piping design the in-series tank also has a benefit from controllability because we can look at a single temperature sensor and control on and off as we have cool water typically in tank one warm water maybe at the top of it making warm or hotter water and then two tanks of hot water and so an in-series storage tank design is a really great approach to get larger storage tank volumes um, with without having to worry about balancing across multiple tanks and it also helps simplify the control system so when a user opens a hot water tap we have hot water that flows out of the top of our third storage tank this will draw in cold water to our first storage tank and then if this temperature sensor drops below maybe 100 or 120 degrees we tell our heat pump to turn on that pulls cool water into the heat pump. The heat pump heats that water up by moving heat into it. It discharges that hot water into the top of our third storage tank, and that's pushing the water backwards this way through there. And so as soon as the hot water then, this red layer here makes it to this, this temperature sensor in storage tank one, then we can turn off the system and wait until we get more hot water draws and that cool tank fills up again and we start the heating cycle. It's a very great, simple control approach uh, that's very reliable and allows you to use multiple tanks to achieve a larger storage tank volume without having to worry about balancing across your tanks. So, when we have you know, our storage tanks, there's some additional considerations specific to these commercial heat pump water heating systems that we should be aware of. One is just the physical space, the room and door sizes. We want to make sure that we can get this storage tank into the room that the architect has designed. And heat pump water heating systems can take up more physical space or more floor area than a gas water heating system will. So it's best to early on coordinate with that architect on the team to make sure that you have enough physical space in that room to get a good layout, to get good maintenance, access, and serviceability, but also the rooms and the door or the door size is, is adequate uh, for that tank installation, moving it into place. And then vertical is better than horizontal. Heat pumps are much more efficient and much more reliable when taking cool water and making it hot. And so vertical allows for a great stratification, cool water at the bottom of the tank, hot water at the top of that tank. Horizontal, on the other hand, you can still get cool water at the bottom of the tank and hot at the top, but you typically have a much uh, larger transitional profile of warm water in the middle of the tank with a larger, volume and area. And so vertical in general is better than horizontal storage tanks because it's increasing your effective storage volume or how much storage, useful storage capacity you actually have. And then also consider what you're piping. Are they multiple tanks in series or parallel? How are you controlling? That piping design definitely uh, needs to be integrated with the control system as we're based or we're controlling off those sensors which are in the tank and they're going to respond slightly different whether it's a parallel or series uh, piping design. It's also important to understand the height of the control sensors. We're using those control sensors to turn on or off. So if they're higher in the system, there's going to be more cold water that can move up into there before we see that it's cool and turn on that sensor. That might be great for a load shift scenario, but we want to make sure we have adequate storage after that, that aquastat or control sensor. And so it's really important that you understand the height of that sensor. And we'll introduce the EcoSizer, a free online tool. And that program allows you to um, uh, 
alter how high that sensor is in the tank, and then that allows or that results in some predicted or recommended storage volume sizes. So there's ways to um, to get some advice and and uh, there's some tools that are built for really uh, simple user friendly tools that that will help you evaluate what height that control sensor needs to be at or the range that that it can be in for steady operation. And then the other thing to be worried or conscious about is the pipe connections and sizing. If we're doing multiple tanks in series, we want to make sure that that is adequately sized to take that full peak flow event. And then how low or high are they in the tank? We ideally want the cold at the very bottom and the hot at the very top. If we have side connections, we might lose some storage volume because we're not cycling this water down here as much. So it's really important to understand where those pipes are going in and out of that tank uh, and, and what size they are when they're entering and exiting. And then the insulation level. Um, the Seattle Energy Code has some requirements on this, but I typically try to specify or specify R16 or better, which is off the shelf available from a lot of storage tank products. Um, and that's because we're storing more hot water in these tanks. There's a larger volume of hot water, larger volume of battery that we, than we do in our gas water heating systems. We typically want to increase the insulation level so we're not adding losses to the system. And you don't have to insulate that much to, to make up that ground. And then thermal isolation. When these metal tanks are on concrete, there needs to be a thermal isolating pad between them. If you're in the commissioning stage and the tank's installed and it's all piped up, it's really challenging to add that thermal isolation after the fact. And so it's really good that you prepare your design and installation team to plan for that, that isolating pad as it's an important energy saving feature. And maintenance and access, um, these tanks are typically bigger and uh, they have the same maintenance procedures that, that most uh, commercial tanks have but we do wanna provide good access to them and design, uh, design that maintenance procedure into the system, into the system design so that it can be um, attended to on a regular basis. And I'll pause for questions there before we go into the third component, which is the temperature maintenance system. Awesome. Yeah, we did have one question. Um, someone asked, is the is thermal isolation pad also code specified? As you know, there's are sort of manufacturer options, and do you have any recommendations for those? Yeah, uh, an R10 pad is a, always a great idea. Um, it's not that expensive either. Um, it is code required, I believe, and it's based on what foundation the storage tank is resting on. Got it, thanks. And what they're trying to prevent is thermal bridging because we have a hot tank, and so the metal of the tank is about the same temperature of the water. And if that metal is resting on a concrete pad, we're going to take a lot of heat from that tank and put it into that concrete pad because uh, the heat's gonna transfer that way. And so by putting a thermal isolating pad between it or an R10 piece of insulation, we can significantly reduce the amount of impact that it has. All right, so the next thing is the temperature maintenance system. and this is arguably the most challenging aspect for a heat pump water heater. Um, this is where I've seen a lot of designs fail or installations fail is based on how this temperature maintenance load was treated. 
So what is the temperature maintenance system? What am I talking about? This probably isn't that familiar of a term to a lot of us. It's essentially the distribution piping in the building that we're maintaining temperature in to reduce the wait time for an occupant to open their shower and hot water comes out. We want that response time to be less than 10 to 30 seconds. If we're at a couple minutes, then that user will flush out a bunch of cool water that at one time was hot water, so it has a higher energy use and load. And we also don't want to be wasting water, especially seeing um, how much drought uh, is or how much drought there is across all of the, the West Coast. So the temperature maintenance system is that distribution piping. It's also the mixing valve and the circulation pump because typically we're circulating water through that distribution piping to keep it warm or at temperature, right? That pump is maybe operating at five gallons per minute, a slow flow rate, and that is pushing 120 degree water out that pipe and through it. And by the time it gets over here, it's closer to 115. And so that circulation pump is typically present in that temperature maintenance system. And then in our heat pump water heating systems, we might have a dedicated storage tank with a heat source. And we're doing that to decouple or to separate the primary heating load from that temperature maintenance heating load. Because we learned that our primary heat pump water heaters, if they're single pass, they're really efficient and reliable at taking cold water and making it hot for use. But they're less reliable, they're less efficient when we reheat that temperature maintenance or that warm water with a single pass heat pump water heater. And so we might apply or specify a dedicated temperature maintenance tank and it might have a heat pump connected to it that's configured in multi-pass. And we'll step through that in session two in a little bit more detail to come up with some solutions and recommendations for you all on how to deal with this um, hot water circulation temperature maintenance load as it's often the most challenging aspect of getting these systems into build buildings and having them operate reliably and efficiently. So we're gonna look at this a little bit further. Our primary heat pumps for our heat pump that's configured in single pass is really good at taking cold water and making it hot. And we can mix that water and send it out to the building. Really great. This would be a very robust, reliable and efficient system design shown here on the screen. When we add that temperature maintenance for that hot water circulation loop and pipe that back to our primary storage tank, we end up mixing that tank up with a bunch of, shown here, yellow water, but assume that's maybe 100 to 110 degree water. And so now when our heat pump water heater turns on, it's gonna draw in that warm water. And depending on what refrigerant it's using, the ambient air temperature, and what part of its cycle it's in, it might do that successfully, but in a lot of cases, it can be really challenged to do this. And what will happen is it will go out on high head pressure or some other alarm in that heat pump water heater. And so that's one of the reasons that at Ecotope, we always design in a dedicated temperature maintenance system so that we can isolate this load and remove it from that primary heat pump and then provide some other way to reheat that temperature maintenance load. It also, when we return our hot circulation water, it's about 110 degrees back to this tank, it mixes up this tank. And so instead of having a lot of hot water at the top, a little bit of warmish water and then cool water at the bottom, we now just have a little bit of hot water at the top and mostly you know, warmish water, but not above 120 what we're trying to send out it out to the system. 
So it's going to decrease the effective storage volume, right? Because our, we might have sized assuming that this tank was completely full of hot water. And then if we design this type of system in, in reality, there might be just a little bit of hot water at the top and it's mostly full of this mixed return water temperature. And that can be a concern for our sizing because we have to meet a given load. And so this is a case where we might run out of hot water or our heat pump stops working or needs to shut off and restart based on pressure alarms. Um, or we basically just don't have a big enough battery because we thought that battery was going to be 100% charged at the start of a water use period. And in reality, it's closer to 50% charge on the best case scenario before that uh, first water draw period. So like I said, we're going to dive into some solutions on how to deal with this temperature maintenance load in session two but it really comes down to providing dedicated systems, uh, either a heat pump or some other way to reheat that, that temperature maintenance load. And another critical aspect of the uh, temperature maintenance system is the mixing valve. We might be storing water at 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit in our primary storage tanks, and we want to send that water out closer to 120 degrees to the fixtures in the building and our distribution system. So a mixing valve is a great device that can reliably do that. And I would highly encourage you to look at electronic thermostatic mixing valves as they have a typically a much quicker response time and are much more reliable at achieving that 120 degrees out to the tenants. And on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the mixing valve at Jackson Apartments, one of our case studies, and on the right from Elizabeth James. And you can see that Jackson Apartments actually has two mixing valves in parallel because these mixing valves will respond to a certain flow range. And so if we have a large building, we often put two in parallel so that one can operate for the lower flow rate, flow rates, and then both can operate in tandem for the higher flow rates. And that allows for great controllability through across you know, the multiple flow rates that we see in these commercial building applications. But they don't have to be these massive built up systems that come with a circulation pump and a controller like at Jackson Apartments. They can be a much smaller valve. This is serving a 60 unit apartment building, the Elizabeth James, and it has similar components to most thermostatic mixing valves shown here, and then a small 12 volt controller on the wall. So it's really important that these are appropriately sized. If you size it based on how big the hot water distribution main is in the building, let's say you have a four inch main and you put a four inch mixing valve on it, it's probably not gonna be appropriately sized. And so you really need to look at the manufacturer's literature and uh, consult with the plumbing design team to uh, get those peak flow rates and those average flow rates that you'll be seeing in that building and appropriately size this mixing valve for that uh, given flow range rather than just matching the main distribution pipe is a four inch, so I'm gonna provide a four inch here. Or it's a two inch, so I'll provide a two inch it's really important that you accurately size that to get that response time that's published in the manufacturer's literature. And then the last system component is the control system. And this is what's turning everything on and off um, based on temperatures in our storage tanks. And there's a few options for this in our commercial heat pump water heating systems. We can always specify, or most of the time, a third-party control system, which would be a site built or third party to the heat pump to turn on and off equipment, to send it a signal based on the temperature in the storage tank. And this system might also allow us to send out email alarms or maintenance notifications 
uh, or trending energy efficiency data so that we can better understand everything that's going on in our commercial heat pump water heating systems. If you're going with the third party control system and you have an electric resistance or some kind of backup system, I would highly recommend that you integrate that control system with that backup so that you can understand when it's running to prevent that from, from operating. Because the great thing about backups is when something goes down, that backup system comes right online and provides heat into the building or to the system. And so we might not notice that there's an issue if we don't have a, some kind of notification from our heat pump or some type of major failure. And then once we get the energy bill, we might notice, oh my God, my energy bill is three times as much. Oh, that's because I've been running on my backup system, even though I paid for this really awesome uh, energy efficient heat pump water heating system. So highly recommend um, integrating that backup control with, with your third party controller when present. But we can have very simple control systems. Most of the heat pump manufacturers, if not all of them, have controls built into the heat pump. And that can turn that unit on and off based on a heating call and the temperature in a storage tank. But it typically isn't gonna interface with other pieces of equipment that are in our commercial system. And it probably won't be sending us email alarms or maintenance notifications uh, like, like third party controllers can do. But it's always an option and it's typically the, the lower cost option, of course. So that internal control system, we're gonna have some control panel or interface to it. We're going to be able to set the outgoing water temperature and set our thermal on and off temperatures. And that's gonna be looking at a temperature sensor, an aquastat um, or a resistive sensor in the storage tank to tell that unit what temperature it is and whether it needs to turn on and off. Your integrated products typically have this built in and you can adjust those thermal on and off points as well as the uh, stored water, water temperature point and backup um, electric resistance uh, temperature points, set points. So an op or a great option that usually comes with the equipment um, and is, is often the low cost option for these commercial systems. But if you have a large multifamily building and you have a more complicated system, maybe you already have a BMS system in the building, I would highly recommend you look at third party controls or trying to integrate the heat pump controls with other components in the system like your backup electric resistance tanks, your thermostatic mixing valve, and your circulation pumps. It typically can all be done. And if you get the data and know about it, it is typically very beneficial to diagnosing problems and issues that may arise. So here is, um, a uh, screen grab from the Block 11 project, which actually uses water source heat pump water heaters, not air source heat pump water heaters. And it extracts heat from a wastewater vault and puts that heat into the domestic water for, for use in the building. So we're not reusing wastewater or anything like that. We simply have heat exchangers in a large wastewater vault and so that vault is acting like our pond loop or our ocean loop, our geothermal. It's our source to extract heat from. And because we had a more complicated system with that wastewater heat recovery system, we decided to go with the third party controller because it could communicate alarms, maintenance notifications, vault status, as well as turn on and off the heat pumps based on a heating call. So there often are reasons to do that, especially in our more complicated or larger commercial building systems. Um, and it's fantastic when you can integrate this with the, with the BMS system that might be present in that larger commercial building. And I can pause for questions here um, before uh, moving forward. And uh, we're 
coming up to time. Um, so any questions, I think this is a good point. Otherwise I'll keep going, Trevor. Yeah, we did have um, one when you're talking about the um, electronic thermostatic mixing valves. Uh, someone just asked like sort of what happens when the power is out and like continue when tenants continue to draw that hot water, like what is the, but what, what yeah. should be taking into account for that situation? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, a lot of these have battery banks built in or some of them do, I don't know if a lot is the correct word so that there can be a short duration of no power to the mixing valve and it still still uh, provides uh, tempered water to the occupants. Other ones, depending on what occupancy you're serving, you can specify them to go completely cold um, or stay in the position they're at essentially. And going completely cold is great because it prevents people from being, you know, therm or scalded scalded from the hot water, but it means that cold water is going to be going out into the building. Um, so there's, you know, there's varying options to address some of the concerns with losing power for those electronic mixing valves, and it really just depends on the building type and application. Got it, thanks. So we love getting feedback from you because it helps us uh, tweak these presentations and change them up to better suit you, our audience. Um, so some of these key takeaways are, are really great for us. So if you guys uh, are still there and want to go to back to the Slido, uh, any key takeaways from the components of our commercial heat pump water heating system? We have our primary heat pump. It's doing the, it's our main engine, it's moving heat into water. It's doing that big lift. Typically we're configuring it in a single pass heating cycle. And then we have our primary storage tank, which is where we're storing that water. That's our battery bank so that we can uh, send out water during our peak use periods and not run out of water and let that heat pump run when it's, when it's best or most, most appropriate for that heat pump to cycle on and off. And then our temperature maintenance system, which is present in our gas and electric resistance water heating systems, but we have to pay more attention to it in our commercial heat pump water heating systems, is also another one of those um, four components. And it's often what, uh, what has been most challenging for this technology is dealing with that temperature maintenance load associated with circulating water through the distribution piping. And then the fourth component is our controls. We got to um, you know, have a good robust control system. We might wanna specify alarm functionality to it, um, especially if our maintenance personnel isn't that familiar with the system, it's, it's great that they have some place and some mechanism that's, that's uh, helping them ensure that none of the tenants run out of hot water. Um, create some key takeaways. The commercial heat pump water heater systems cut the energy use by 3x. Absolutely an amazing energy efficiency measure. Uh, heat pump water heating systems, regardless of their commercial or not, will do that too. So if you have a residential electric resistance water heater in your home, I highly recommend you swap it out to a heat pump just make sure you have a good source of air uh, and that it can operate in that, in that range. But Seattle basements are great locations for our 134A integrated uh, residential heat pumps. Uh, yes, there's typically recordings and there's PDFs that we can share with you. So I'm glad you're gonna share this out there. We wanna educate as many people as possible. Uh, we're all doing this together. And so sharing is, is, is the right approach in my mind. Yep, on that too, yeah. The um, recordings and the like slides that constantly, they'll be available on the site, I think in the next like two or three days once we get all processed, so thanks. And someone understands the temperature maintenance system, fantastic. It's always a struggle. It was a struggle for me. It's not something that we've been thinking about with you know our current domestic hot water systems. And so I'm glad that uh, you made sense of my explanation today. And then um, 
commercial systems prioritize tank sizing over heat capacity. Yeah, and temperature maintenance is the most challenging aspect. Absolutely, um, those are those are two points to definitely take home. And I'd highly encourage you to go to ecosizer.com, and it's a great free online sizing tool that a bunch of smart engineers at Ecotope developed, and it allows you to trade off between how much storage volume you need and how much heat capacity you need to meet a given load based on how many occupants you define in the building, how many apartments there are, and what the water use is per day per occupant. Unfortunately, that tool right now is only appropriate for multifamily residential. And with hotel, if you make a few um, after the fact corrections, but we are developing uh, uh, or adding to it to incorporate other load profiles like office, restaurant, hospital, and other hospitality occupancies. So it should be available um, in the next uh, few months or later, later in 2022, and will be a great tool for, I think, a lot of the folks out there um, to utilize. Great, and so then the last section we have is, is it a candidate? And we talked a lot about multifamily buildings and because we have this 25% of the pie that's associated with heating water for domestic use, heat pump water heaters make a lot of sense here. We can dramatically save the energy there, 17% on average. But there are also other building types that use hot water that would be great applications for heat pump water heating. And so the more water you use in the building, the more energy savings you're going to have with a commercial heat pump water heating system. So senior care facilities, definitely a lot of water use. Hospitals, public safety, lodging, lots of water use. Supermarket and groceries, tons of water use, especially if you have some of those uh, self-service or pre-made food counters great applications uh, for heat pump water heating systems. Office buildings, um, less water use, of course, than maybe our lodging or our hotels. We're not taking showers at our office, at least not everyone is, um, but still there's tons of reasons to, or there's enough energy savings there to apply a commercial heat pump water heating system to serve, to serve that type of occupancy. And education is a great one. Um, we've actually seen, you know, there's some uptick in, in water use in all of our educational facilities. And uh, depending on what, you know, age the kids are and how much gym use there is, there's varying levels of, of hot water use. But often those um, commercial kitchen environments in our schools are one of those big drawers or big high users of, of water or high users of hot water. And so a commercial heat pump really makes sense there as well. And so here's our recap. We talked about why I choose a commercial heat pump water heating system. We talked about what it is. We know that it can look a lot different depending on what building we're serving and what those occupants are, or how those occupants are using water in that building. We talked about the four components and how they all interact together. We're gonna to dive more into the temperature maintenance system in session two and some solutions for it, for reliable and efficient designs. And then uh, what makes a good candidate? I would argue that every building that uses hot water is a great candidate for a heat pump water heater. And the buildings like senior care, residential, hotel, um, and, and other buildings, fire stations that have a lot of hot water use are an even better candidate for that heat pump water heating system. And so the next time we're going to talk about key design considerations that are essential for success, right? We all want success. And we're going to try to break down some of those key design considerations so that we can all um, be there. And then session three is from design to implementation. This is looking through the installer's lens. Um, after an engineer specifies a heat pump water heater, how does that installer go to the manufacturer, 
purchase it and make sure it gets installed correctly so that it's a reliable and efficient system. And then session four, how do we maintain and operate these systems? The control sequence is really important. And so we want to make sure that that's set up right initially during the commissioning process. But also we want to design in maintenance procedures so that these are operating uh, really reliably for the duration of their life because it's often the simple, oh, I forgot to clean the air filter that causes a bigger problem. And those bigger problems are very, very expensive. The cleaning the air filter is maybe 10 to 30 minutes of someone's time, so a lot less expensive, and we just need to be doing those routine maintenance procedures. Um, so I hope you can all join us for the later sessions or the ones that you're most interested in, depending on uh, your line of work here in the commercial building environment. And Trevor, we, um, I don't know if you wanna cover this, but we also have some more uh, courses. Uh, this is one part of that eight hour seminar. And we do a lot of uh, trainings and uh, trainings on these systems. Um, yeah. So always keep in touch with the Lighting Design Lab or other utilities in your area to, do, to keep up to date on those trainings and resources. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Colin, for all the great information and for everyone for the, the questions throughout. Um, yeah, just like Colin said, so we have this one is going to be a four part series. And then we'll also have um, some additional trainings coming in through the end of the year and then also into next year. So continue to please check the Lighting Design Labs. Um, course as we uh, as we add more on there. I know there's gonna be a lot more content and talking about different applications of these systems. So thank you all very much um, for joining us here today. Um, and yeah, like I said, we'll get the recordings and also the uh, materials out to you. And I think this is just the exit survey. So if you could just do uh, one last slide over here for us, just sort of tell us, you know, what you what you thought of the course and then any other sort of feedback you have. and and uh, you know, things that sort of stuck out to you, that would be really helpful for us as we continue to, to hone this in. Um, and I think with that, we can pretty much close it out, maybe give them just a couple minutes here to, to fill out that survey. Um, and if you, have, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in there. Great, thanks everyone for attending and uh, be, being attentive and engaging with me. I really appreciate it. Um, it was uh, a lot of fun to present in person and it's still fun to present in this virtual environment but it, it's it's a lot more fun when you engage and ask questions so really appreciate all your questions and and time today uh and, and involvement with this really efficient and great technology <clears throat> awesome you yeah, know if you want to go forward con to see if there's any questions that may remain What'd you do there? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Get out of college. <laughs> Design considerations for retrofit. Yeah, um, that's a great, great question. There's I think the design considerations that we're going to cover in session two will be great at addressing some of the design considerations for retrofit applications of large systems. Um, I would say that those large systems, especially healthcare and university, are typically sized with a ton of heat capacity, like a lot of heat capacity, because it's cheap, it's inexpensive, and they don't want to run out of hot water. If we do that with a heat pump water heating system, we're not gonna run out of hot water, but we're going to have a very expensive first cost for that system installation. So it would be better to actually look at the true load of the healthcare or university building and use that load, measure it over the course of a month or the course of a year is better. Use that load to predict your actual peak water usage see how that compares to the sizing that's currently there, and then use that to evaluate how to size your heat pump water heater. Because if you just strictly, or if you approach this by matching the existing heat capacity of the gas system 
with the new heat capacity of the heat pump system, it will probably work fine, but you're just gonna end up spending a lot of money where you could have put that money into maybe another efficiency program or, or somewhere else or saved on that first cost. Heat pump for primary building heat. Uh, on any integrated units of the mode switch that BMS can change. I do know that there's some integrated units that are working to take in a load shift signal um, from a CT2045 port. And so that might be able to integrate with the BMS system, but I'm a very uh, hands hands-on mechanical engineer, not an electrical engineer or a control engineer. So I don't know if it, it if it can, but I would be hopeful that that, that technology that they're implementing with the, with the CT2045 port uh, would be able to, to interface that way. And then uh, we, Ecotope typically doesn't do that many residential homes anymore, um, but uh, we always love uh, really efficient design solutions. So I'm curious where your current home heating system is and, and how you want to improve it or fix it. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us here at Ecotope. And uh, thanks everyone. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you uh, in session two. And then Evan Green will be covering session three and session four. So please join us for that. Yeah, thank you all very much. I hope you have a uh, great rest of your day. Thanks.